Thanks for tuning into Insight. Uh, and this is a very special episode because we are talking about something that is on top of everybody's minds, the domestic two-wheeler industry. The last two years were punctuated by the EV onslaught, if I can use that term, and what it could do to incumbents. Well, they've survived, they've thrived, so to say, and now they are getting out of the bandwagon in a big way. But I think the discussion around two-wheelers is not just about what EVs are doing currently, but how the two, in India at least, uh, can coexist over the near term and what to take away from all of that. Our expert today to talk about the space is Nirav Sheth of MK. He needs no introduction. He joins us on the show to talk about his thoughts and his key insights. And of course, together me and Nirav will be questioning unequivocally an industry leader, Mr. Rakesh Sharma, ED of Bajaj Auto. Gentlemen, both of you, thank you so much for taking the time out. Thank uh, you. Yes. Nirav, a quick thought from you to kickstart this and then we'll... Uh, then I'll make you uh, co-anchor with me when we try and quiz Mr. Sharma. But one quick insight from you, uh, Why have you chosen to talk about two-wheelers and what is your thesis about what happens in the near to the medium term? Well, I think uh, the way we look at two-wheelers is that if you now look at uh, the total numbers of two-wheelers on the road, uh, they probably total about 180 million to about 200 million, which means that it's a fully penetrated category. But the thing is that we are 30% of the peak volumes, which was roughly about 23-24 million way back in FY19. And uh, Mr. Sharma will talk about it, but it is our assessment that the replacement cycle has been fairly elongated. And I think that, you know, that has to revert back to mean. You've done some rough numbers. It stands at about some 67 months. The long-term average is about 54-55 months. Uh, and therefore, we believe that uh, you are likely at a cups of a very, very strong cyclical recovery, which will surprise uh, the market participants, number one. Uh, and secondly, uh, we believe that the, for the first time, you will have two wheelers which will outpace the growth rates in other parts of the auto industry, which is basically the passenger cars uh, and the CVs as well. Uh, and then obviously, for us, the valuations are very important. So three strong pillars. Uh, but obviously, uh, the core argument remains the fact that uh, you could have a very, very strong cyclical recovery. Okay. So, we'll do the valuation conversation with you, Nirav, separately uh, on the show later on. But let's first get the industry perspective and what could be happening here. And joining, uh, as we said, joining us is Mr. Sharma. Mr. Sharma, uh, let me start off with a, with a very basic question. Uh, the next, say, 12 to 18 to 24 months, whether in the forms of it being a cyclical recovery or in terms of uh, how the rural spends might be going up in a pre-election year and what that might do to the two-wheeler industry and maybe your business as well individually. Can you share some lights on how you as running one of the largest two-wheeler companies in the country are thinking about this aspect? Okay. <clears throat> it's a very uh, good question. And, uh, you know, if one takes a slightly medium term view, as you have said, if one starts with, let's say, 24 to 36 months uh, period uh, and examines the fundamental drivers of uh, demand for two dealers, they are still very, very strong. You know, in our experience, the things which, of course, which impact two wheeler demand is, of course, the, uh, the state of the economy, the uh, purchasing power. Uh, with our customers, the uh, the roads, the construction of the uh, roads, uh, the penetration, which Mr. Sheet also talked about, uh, in all, and I would say that in all the three and the demographics, which is uh, you know the youthful nature of our uh, population, which gives rise to the need for mob independent mobility with public transport struggling to keep pace with requirements, people wanting to travel even from one small town to another, even on a daily basis, and with roads coming up, we, and the young people looking out for jobs outside their homes. Uh, these drivers are quite universal because we have experience in over 80, 90 countries, and we find that these drivers are pretty fundamental and universal, and they're strong. I would say still the market is not fully penetrated, particularly when I look at it in contrast to fully penetrated markets like Indonesia, a large economy. And I think Indonesia is a fair uh, comparison. What starts to happen is that the second and the third vehicle starts to come in. Even car owners start to 
have keep a, a two wheeler just for you know uh, smaller uh, sort of runs and the fact that even today 35% to 40% of our buyers are first time buyers the moment you get into uh, you know, high levels of penetration you find this starts to drop to 15% uh, or so so this does indicate that the fundamental drivers are strong from a uh, medium term point of view the industry's trajectory is definitely pointing upwards just please, however yeah please, having please. just to complete the point however given the fact that you know almost 65 70% of our buyers have incomes of uh, below 40 to 50000 rupees uh, per month the fate of the industry is very very closely tied with the broad uh, economic outlook so while the medium term outlook may be very positive the demand drivers may be strong but in on the day in the quarter in the year how the economy is progressing is very very uh, important and that is why what was just referred to as you know the peak of 2018 19 and the drop we started to drop uh, the industry started to drop even before covid and that was reflecting about uh, the nature of the economic growth which the country has been experiencing which according to me is now straightening out but the nature of the economic growth was that it was favoring it was going more in the pockets of the high end customers and less in the pockets of the low end customers and then of course covid struck which eroded the savings and then purchasing power got impacted and the recovery has only just started where the income certainty and flow to the pockets of the uh, you know lower segments has just begun to be experienced and which has uh, released a little bit of optimism uh, in the market you just answered my question you preempted that almost nirav uh, i'll bring you in uh, your 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 turn yeah so um, uh, sir i sort of agree i'm just and this is more to try and understand the thought process uh, i completely agree that uh, the markets have cratered in the last 3 or 4 years and last part of that is also because of very high price inflation uh, and in relation to per capita incomes i am just wondering that industry has not responded by either holding the price lines or being more disruptive on the pricing i mean a case in point is just like tesla who would have thought that you know they would take a 30% price cut just to increase the affordability uh, and i understand that this is a mature industry uh, but is that that the, uh, is is there a case to be made that uh, you know the industry has probably sort of uh, favored profitability over trying to drive penetration uh, can we accuse you of that Uh, yeah i mean that is always an option it is a very uh, important uh, debate and discussion all the time within the company uh, you know whether one should be stepping and we have uh, done that in the past now if you further sort of uh, uh, peel the onion and go into the nature of demand in the bottom half so the indian two wheeler industry can be divided into top half which is 125 cc and above which is almost 48% of the market and the bottom half which is 52% of the market which is the 100 cc within the 100 cc also there is a bottom bottom you know uh, and that is where the whole thing has fallen off now this segment the dilemma is that okay we can cut uh, prices and we can sort of uh, uh, get some more volumes and some share etc however it is not sustainable to what purpose should we do that because the moment you will uh, increase the prices the volume fall off the shares fall off so something which is so transitory uh, and we went through this cycle as bajaj auto in i think 2019 where we did with our low entry brand ct100 uh, you know cut prices to provoke uh, demand and all that and we got returns but the price sensitivity of this segment is so acute that any change in price it's not like that okay you get the people into the consumption cycle and then slowly increase the price and so that you are you got a better mix of volume and margin in your company the demand starts to fall off so our lesson is that it is very difficult to fight macroeconomics uh with our power with our pricing and margin power which we have at our command and this is also true internationally we have followed this policy internationally as you know we face severe stress of devaluation in a lot of 
emerging markets and there has been a lot of outcry that uh, let's adjust the pricing from our partners there so that we can you know uh, keep the retail going but at the end of the day we have realized to these expensive lessons in our history that if there is a fundamental macroeconomic factor which is out of place don't try to fight it you know we are very happy to shed margins in an equilibrium condition to grab co- a competitive position and then you know build on it uh, further but not to fight macroeconomics to fight another competitor yes uh, in a uh, key segment but we would not sort of start to open the purse to balance out the macroeconomic pressures therefore for that we just have to roll and the fundamental answer to that to, to fighting that is through innovation but you yourself alluded to the fact that it's a mature industry and the degrees of freedom which are available to innovate on the cost and technology front at the entry level are very very slender it is mature the degrees of freedom are less so it's you know operating room is very low when it comes to innovating out there got it so essentially uh, you cannot build scale where the cost curve can come down and therefore uh, and there, therefore those market shares become transitory in a way yes absolutely right the 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 uh, costs are not so scale sensitive at, uh, over there so it's not yeah. as if you double our volumes our cost will come down i think the costs are already down they're scale insensitive at this stage uh, at this level of play Neeraj, please continue. Neeraj, you want me to go? I have yeah, one yeah, more question. Yeah, yeah. Please continue. Please continue. Maybe. Please continue. So obviously, the big debate, and it's very interesting, is obviously around electrification. My personal view remains the fact that Indian incumbents are better placed uh, to play in this electrification game because we are the largest in two wheelers, and you don't have the disadvantage of uh, you know. Uh, not being up the software curve and stuff like that so the four wheelers have a different level of uh, competitive advantages uh, in terms of uh, the level of automation and the software uh, requirements and all uh, surprisingly again you know the incumbents uh, are not at the forefront in terms of driving uh, this electrification where we believe that probably the cost curve could fall rapidly uh, is our assessment right because so far when we do some break up of uh, the cost between an ic engine and an electrified uh, scooter the gap is almost about two times uh, is there a case that in some next few years this can come down rapidly and without subsidies we can make a case for uh, having at least a neutrality in terms of cost of ownership yeah so uh, i mean there are two questions over there you know one is uh, you asked about the incumbents and uh, we are uh, an incumbent and in fact um, we were probably uh, almost the first off the block uh, i mean if you look at it volumetrically uh, i agree with you that volumetrically it may appear that uh, oh incumbents have uh, fallen behind i cannot speak for you know the others but i can certainly uh, talk about uh, what our position is over here our position over here is that we are looking at it as a very long term play we think that electrification is here to stay with subsidy without subsidy the cell costs are going up and down because of demand supply imbalance and all that so there are a lot of uncertainties but fundamentally in the mind of the customer there is a switch which has taken place particularly in india when the petrol prices crossed 100 rupees if you see the kind of people who are buying um, uh, the electric scooters they range from the very affluent uh, in posh areas to the very uh, humble trades people who are using it for uh, going uh, every day a plumber or a gardener or whoever the full spectrum now that's quite tremendous for a new category to come and get a traction across the entire segment so that is telling us that the customer has said that i want freedom from this whole thing of being a prisoner of the petrol prices going up and down i can't take my monthly budget i'll have certainty with electric one time high cost i'll pay maybe i'll get a loan and then there is freedom that switch has taken place and fundamentally that is what is going to drive the industry rest of the stuff will either be barriers for some time 
or will be accelerators, you know, in terms of whether the charging infrastructure is there, whether the cell costs are coming down, the uncertainty around the subsidy. Those are secondary issues, but primarily the customer is wanting. So our assessment is electrification is, uh, the, uh, is here to stay and it will progress. It may accelerate based on subsidies or cell costs, or it may go progress more slowly. So as Bajaj Auto, we better, if we want to retain our position, and in fact, we see this as a great opportunity to advance our position, not just in an India level, but at a global level. Because now we look at our business with half of it coming from overseas as a global play. And there are vast segments geographically and product-wise, like scooters, where Bajaj Auto has not been there. ASEAN, where we are highly underpenetrated because it's mostly scooters and mopeds and step-throughs. These are opening up for us. In India, this is opening up for us. The scooter segment is opening up for us. So we see this as a very big opportunity. However, having said that, we feel that in the early phase, we have to invest in R&D. Today, the thing which has really worked in our favor um, when we have gone and made a global play for uh, motorcycles is the fact that we have a strong in-house R&D, right? So there is a lot of investment in R&D. There's a lot of investment in manufacturing. There's a lot of investment in supply chain. There's an investment in exclusive dealer network. All that is not reflected on the volume front as yet, but it is preparing us for the marathon. We don't think it is a sprint. So we are not getting distracted by the fact that, oh, we must sell 20,000 units. We are saying that, okay, how much? And we, I must confess here that always plans don't go as the way you want them to. So we had supply chain glitches in the first half. A lot of the last year was lost in supply chain glitches where we are trying to, uh, you know, get our supply chain right, get our cost right, get certainty right. But for sure, if you look at other metrics besides volume as to the number of people involved in the industry, which of course this is information which is not uh, publicly available. I agree with that. I can only indicate to you about this. There, if you look, examine those kind of investments, I think it will tell you that the incumbents and certainly Bajaj Auto uh, are very much over there and you will see, and already you will see if the subsidy is changing now, Already the wheat will separate from the shaft. The milk and the water will start to separate. And then the stronger companies, whether they are incumbents or new companies, the companies which are strong uh, on a sustainable basis, you will see their rise. And we hope to be ahead of the pack over a medium, a medium term. That certainly, we don't want to have a Kodak moment at all where we are found, oh my God, this electric thing has just passed us by and we were sleeping on our watch. How will we answer to our juniors who take over the leadership from us in a few years time? Uh, we are all very, very conscious of that. But there is a responsibility which we owe to our vendors. I mean, we can't ask them to invest crores of rupees. We are setting up an exclusive distribution network we have to ensure our dealers are break even. So we have to do this in a calibrated way. We don't have private equity dollars to throw. And even if we had that, we would be very, very circumspect about asking this whole ecosystem of people who we carry with us, which is the vendors and the dealers, they have to be successful too, because we are only as strong as them. So uh, this is always a, a factor in our mind. And that is why we are taking a more calibrated approach. And as we move forward, things will start to settle. We can already see the subsidy regime is now getting into some kind of a, uh, you know, the ambiguity is getting over and certainty is appearing. So that is what our uh, approach is. Uh, so that is holding the cost curve back in a sense that, you know, when I look at most of uh, the available products, they are about 130. That is without uh, the GST or 28%, no road tax. And yet they don't make any gross margins worth talking about. Uh, yeah. what, what, what is causing such a big discrepancy in an IC engine cost and an electric uh, scooter cost? It's the cell costs. It's the whole battery, yeah. which is very, very uh, expensive. It is the entire, that is the whole thing. And see the cell costs, which have been decreasing at the rate of 10% per annum for a four or five year period, has suddenly started to rise. And, and the reason for that is also that, you know, Suddenly, when the shift and the new chemistry started to come in, 
we are only looking at two wheelers but there is four wheelers is huge requirement even some ships are now getting electrified so the demand for lithium ion cells has skyrocketed but the supply as you know doesn't come in a continuous manner it comes in lumps it comes in discrete steps and uh, and there is some holding back from the big players because there are alternate technologies which are appearing so nobody wants to invest a huge sum of money in a technology which can be yeah. outclassed by let's say lithium ion moving to sodium ion which is 3 4 years from uh, commercialization or hydrogen side so you know so uh, therefore we have seen the cell cost sort of bottoming out and increasing and that is one of the main reasons for uh, the cost of the ev vehicles being uh, high got it um i have a, i have a couple of follow ups so, mr sharma we we done with the allocated time but if you have 5 or 10 more minutes just a couple of questions if you do have 5 minutes 5 minutes okay, minutes, okay. Uh, because i've got another meeting sounds yeah. good just just one quick follow up or two questions rolled into one or one so the the is it the easy money regime private equity chasing growth which do uh, you reckon has led lu some of the newcomers capture mind share because i was of the opinion that in any industry Uh, a set of incumbents would, would never let newcomers grab mind share and that has happened in the ev space and as you said that it's a thing for the future so would if easy money would have been available would you have not gone down this route of letting newcomers grab mind share because whatever is lost is a market share lost see uh, you know uh, let me tell you that there is enough easy money for even the incumbents we have got a uh, our ev business being handled by chetak technology limited which mm. is now a separate company you think there are no uh, applications to us no i am saying this uh, because you uh, mentioned that if you have there are people there are bankers coming to us with proposals and private equity is coming to us with proposals of uh, you know uh, and their arguments are very persuasive that this easy money is available ha huh. uh, don't you take this money and move with it that option is available to so, so, also, so right? why like newcomers people... take the market share or the mind share forget the market Because share the mind share no this, this to some extent this might be a first mover disadvantage we are very happy this is exactly what happened in china the uh, i mean in africa and other places where people went in chinese went in they opened up the market with the cheap cheap uh, motorcycles the customers got a taste of the mo- uh, motorcycle motorcycling and then the good quality companies came in okay. you know so the it the issue is not the easy money the issue is the cost and how the customer will at what rate the customer will uptake we are calibrating to that it is not about uh, you know if you have the easy money the industry will change you switch off the tap and the industry will recede it is exactly like what mr uh, with what need of and i were discussing earlier for the entry level ice uh, scooter yes we can go in with a very cheap cheap uh, self funded uh, entry level motorcycle we will get some volume but what is at the end of the road the moment we increase prices those customers will fall we have done this through retail financing we have funded we subvented down payments all we have got is people who have got into the consumption cycle got who it. should not be there okay. and this is the point we make about subsidy also when you are subsidizing you you are skewing you are making the decision making process very skewed and you are getting people who are not ready got it for that thing. got it so got it got it, got it. okay we have two more minutes i have one question maybe nirav has one but one very quick question so therefore if indeed you believe that uh, better rnd and 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 this patience of not running after the initial market share would mean that you would have two wheeler growth and if there is a cyclic uh, electric two wheeler growth and if there is a cyclical recovery in place for the ice engines as well would it be safe to assume sir that the next 12 to 24 to 36 months would actually see much better numbers uh, growth wise for the two wheeler companies than what we've seen in the preceding three yeah i Oh, certainly. I certainly uh, agree when you compare it with the preceding three. What I'm liking about the current uh, growth is that it's particularly when I look at the March, April, May, and as we talk, May is unfolding, and May is also a mini season in the north. That it's not wild growth. The underlying growth is now single digit, 
it is more on the higher end so it's a more value customer which is coming back in who's examining the value of the uh, product retail financiers are giving more sen- it is very sensible growth which is now driving the industry in the last so in the quality of growth is also very very good in the last 3 or 4 months so and uh, so besides the fact that there is growth the quality of growth fills me um, makes me more optimistic yes of course everyone likes a 15 20% growth but we are not seeing those skyrocketing numbers and it is okay it is not Got such it. a uh, you know the higher faster you rise the higher the harder you fall yes and i think with the uh, tempering of the subsidies the immediate uh, impact will be there will be some sobering up of uh, this breakneck demand which is there there will be some consolidation in the industry and we will see again a rise of electrification now if both these phenomena uh, converge as they appear to be we can look forward to a good uh, 12 to 20 got months. it nirav maybe quick 30 second answer before we let him go quick 30 second question yeah, sorry just one uh, uh, you know just one more question and a brief one of that uh, we we completely understand and appreciate the fact that is our understanding that the upper income households are going to go at a very fast rate as compared that's a natural evolution as the economy progresses Uh, which means that the upper end of the motorcycles. How do you are tapping that market? Because the profit pool is large, the volume share may be low. A uh, KTM, yes. Triumph, yes. uh, very quickly on that. Yeah. So uh, there, uh, Nirav, we have a uh, 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 much better play with our R and D. So uh, it is basically uh, through products and uh, trying to segment the market and giving products at good price points. to all types of customers so if you will see from the 125 cc to the 400 cc segment we've got 20 products uh, right and the next competitor has got 13 or 14 and our innovation engine is really driving that as a priority which is not to say that we are not doing anything in the 100 cc but our priority is very clear that we are focusing very hard on the uh, uh, upper half of the segment and using innovation which has a better scope over there and that we will continue to drive 60% of our business is now coming from the 125 cc plus segment which about 3 uh, years back was only 50% so we are seeing 60 and by the end of the year it will become probably 65% so two thirds of our volumes will come from there and much more of the uh, revenue and the margin got it mr sharma oh. such a pleasure talking to you thank you so much for giving us those insights and Well, I dare say, look forward to have you more often on the platform. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking. Thank you, pleasure Thank you so much. Well, bye. Thank you. Well, viewers, that's the view from Bajaj Auto. Uh, now, Nirav, uh, okay. Firstly, um, a key takeaway from uh, this thing, which either solidifies your view or challenges the view that you ha- held before the interview. Well, so my sense is that uh, uh, it seems that I'm more bullish on displacement demand than. Uh, uh, than Bajaj Auto, uh, uh, that is that is our sense. Uh, but I was slightly surprised to uh, hear the figures that about forty five percent of uh, the buyers are first time buyers. And if uh, that's actually the case, then I believe that the recovery could be stronger, assuming that our thesis of replacement picks up. Uh, uh, but I agree uh, with their assessment about electrification. So I believe that I would want them to make uh, be far more aggressive. Uh, it's an entrepreneur's job. We have to take that risk. Uh, uh, ask the ecosystem to take the risk, like uh, Ola is doing, right? They're going to just raise another three hundred million dollars, going to two billion. Uh, and these are the points that these guys need to uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, hit on at this point of time. Hmm. Uh, just think of it. If you now look at why only two wheelers, if you look at most of the industries, the moment you allow a gap to open up, that is when you have. Uh, a permanent loss of market share right so uh, hero could not do very well uh, in the sports segment and allowed pulsar to become a big uh, brand uh, likewise uh, you had uh, honda with activa uh, uh, being able to come in and segment the market and continue to remain a dominant uh, uh, player in that market so whoever comes and segments a market with a new category remains a market leader this is something that the leaders understand but uh, yeah that's the nature of the market uh, <laughs> i would i would want the incumbents to be far more aggressive uh, and at the cost of uh, running near the losses i think that's the nature of the beast 
Yeah, my final question then, therefore, and you know, sadly, I didn't get a chance to ask him about uh, what else beyond EVs, right? Because if cars are looking at hydrogen fuel and what else as well, whether two wheelers have that thing or not. So I don't know if you have any views there, concrete ones, but part one of that. And part two, Nirav, is this, uh, really, from an investing perspective, a bunch of people talk about how two wheeler companies, if rural growth picks up, the corporate governance standards are high class, uh, you have great dividend yield. Uh, high cash companies, some of these at least, if not all, and therefore they provide you a good fodder for picking up a good value stock at the start of an up cycle. Is that your thesis too, or is it some more additions to that? Well, I think uh, uh, a similar thesis that, uh, you know, we've never believed in this uh, BAP syndrome, which is buy at any price, uh, irrespective of how good the quality franchises are. Uh, two wheelers certainly offer that level of comfort. There is no doubt about it. Uh, a, that you know that uh, the ability to predict cash flows is significantly higher. You can be off by a few percentage points. Secondly, that capital allocation skills are very great. A lot of them pay out reasonable level of dividends, right? Yeah. So, uh, the risk of going wrong over there uh, uh, is lower. And like I said, uh, if you are ahead of the market in terms of trying to predict a cyclical recovery, uh, then that's icing on the cake. And that is what differentiates you from uh, hopefully, uh, the other market investors. Mm. Well, let's see how this shapes up. But Nirav, great having you, uh, giving us those insights and also asking those very nice questions uh, to the management of Bajaj Auto. Uh, thanks for being with us on Insight today. Thank you for having me, Nirav. Always a pleasure talking to you. Likewise, and viewers, thanks for tuning in.